Chapter 31 The Buried City of Pompeii They pronounce it Pompeii. I always had an idea that when you went down into Pompeii with torches by the way of damp, dark stairways, just as you do in silver mines and traversed gloomy tunnels with lava overhead, and something on either hand like dilapidated prisons gouged out of the solid earth that faintly resembled houses. But you do nothing of the kind. Fully one half of the buried city, perhaps, is completely exhumed and thrown open freely to the light of day, and there stand the long rows of solidly built brick houses, roofless, just as they stood eighteen hundred years ago, hot with the flaming sun, and there lie their floors clean swept and not a bright fragment tarnished or waiting of the labored mosaics that pictured them with the beasts and birds and flowers which we copy in perishable carpets today. And here are the Venuses and the Bacchuses and the Adonises making love and getting drunk in many-hued frescoes on the walls of saloon and bedchamber. And there are narrow streets and narrower sidewalks paved with flags of good hard lava, the one deeply rutted with the chariot wheels and the other with the passing feet of the Pompeians of bygone centuries. And there are the bake shops, the temples, the halls of justice, the baths, the theaters, all clean, scraped, and neat, and suggesting nothing of the nature of the silver mine way down in the bowels of the earth the broken pillars lying about, the doorless doorways, and the crumbled tops of the wilderness of walls were wonderfully suggestive of the burnt district in, our, in one of our cities. And if there had been any charred timbers, shattered windows, heaps of debris, and general blackness and smokiness about the place, the resemblance would have been perfect. But no... The sun shines as brightly down on old Pompeii today as it did when Christ was born in Bethlehem, and its streets are cleaner a hundred times than ever Pompeians saw them in their prime. I know whereof I speak, for in the great chief thoroughfares, Merchant Street and the Street of Fortune, have I not seen with my own eyes how for two hundred years, at least, the pavements were not repaired. How ruts five and even ten inches deep were worn into thick flagstones by the chariot wheels of generations of swindled taxpayers. And do I not know by these signs that the street commissioners of Pompeii never attended to their business, and that they never mended the pavements, they never cleaned them, and besides, it is not the inborn nature of street commissioners to avoid their duty whenever they get a chance. I wish I knew the name of the last one that held office in Pompeii so that I could give him a blast. I speak with feeling on this subject because I caught my foot in one of those ruts, and the sadness that came over me when I saw the first poor skeleton with ashes and lava sticking to it, was tempered by the reflection that maybe that party was the street commissioner. No, Pompeii is no longer a buried city. It is a city of hundreds and hundreds of roofless houses and a tangled maze of streets where one could easily get lost without a guide and have to sleep in some ghostly palace that had known no living tenant since that awful November night of eighteen centuries ago. We pass through the gate which faces the Mediterranean, called the Marine Gate, and by the rusty, broken image of Minerva, still keeping tireless watch and ward over the possessions it was powerless to save, and went up a long street and stood in the broad court 
of the Forum of Justice. The floor was level and clean, and up and down either side was a noble colonnade of broken pillars, with their beautiful Ionic and Corinthian columns scattered about them. At the upper end were the vacant seats of the judges. Behind them we descended into a dungeon where the ashes and cinders had found two prisoners chained on that memorable November night and tortured them to death. How they must have tugged at the pitiless fetters as the fierce fires surged around them. Then we lounged through many and many a sumptuous private mansion which we could not have entered without a formal invitation in incomprehensible Latin in the olden time when the owners lived there, and we probably wouldn't have got in. These people built their houses a good deal alike. The floors were laid in fanciful figures, wrought in mosaics of many colored marbles. At the threshold your eyes fall upon a Latin sentence of welcome, sometimes, or a picture of a dog, with the legend, Beware of the Dog, and sometimes a picture of a bear or a fawn with no inscription at all. Then you enter a sort of vestibule, where they used to keep the hat rack, I suppose, next a room with a large marble basin in the midst and the pipes of a fountain on either side are bedrooms. Beyond the fountain is a reception room, then a little garden, dining room, and so forth and so on. The floors were all mosaic. The walls were stuccoed or frescoed or ornamented with bas-reliefs, and here and there were statues, large and small, and little fish pools and cascades of sparkling water that sprang from secret places in the colonnade of handsome pillars that surrounded the court and kept the flower beds fresh and the air cool. Those Pompeians were very luxurious in their tastes and habits. The most exquisite bronzes we have seen in Europe came from the exhumed cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii, and also the finest cameos and the most delicate engravings on precious stones. Their pictures, eighteen or nineteen centuries old, are often much more pleasing than the celebrated rubbish of the old masters of three centuries ago. They were well up in art. From the creation of these works of the first clear up to the eleventh century, art seems hardly to have existed at all. At least no remnants of it are left, and it was curious to see how far, in some things at any rate, these old-time pagans excelled the remote generations of masters that came after them. The pride of the world in sculpture seemed to be the Laocoon and the dying gladiator in Rome. They are as old as Pompeii and were dug from the earth like Pompeii, but their exact age or who made them can only be conjectured. But worn and cracked without a history, and with the blemishing stains of numberless centuries upon them, they still mutely mock at all efforts to rival their perfections. It was a quaint and curious pastime, wandering through this old silent city of the dead, lounging through utterly deserted streets where thousands and thousands of human beings once bought and sold and walked and rode and made the place resound with the noise and confusion of traffic and pleasure. They were not lazy. They hurried in those days. We had evidence of that. There was a temple on one corner, and it was a shorter cut to go between the columns of that temple from one street to the other than to go around. And behold, that pathway had been worn deep into the heavy flagstone floor of the building by generations of time-saving feet. They would not go around when it was quicker to go through. We do that way in our cities. 
Everywhere you see things that make you wonder how old these old houses were before the night of destruction came. Things, too, which bring back those long dead inhabitants and place the living before your eyes. For instance, the steps, two feet thick lava blocks that lead up to the school, and the same kind of steps that lead up into the dress circle of the principal theater are almost worn through. For ages the boys hurried out of that school, and for ages their parents hurried into that theater, and the nervous feet that had been dust and ashes for eighteen centuries have left their record for us to read today. I imagined I could see crowds of gentlemen and ladies thronging into the theater with tickets for secured seats in their hands, and on the wall I read the imaginary placard in infamous grammar. Positively no free list except members of the press. Hanging about the doorway, I fancied, were slouchy Pompeian street boys uttering slang and profanity and keeping a wary eye out for checks. I entered the theater and sat down in one of the long rows of stone benches in the dress circle and looked at the place for the orchestra and the ruined stage and around the wide sweep of empty boxes and thought to myself, This house won't pay. I tried to imagine the music in full blast, the leader of the orchestra beating time, and the versatile so-and-so who had just returned from a most successful tour in the provinces to play his last and farewell engagement of positively six nights only in Pompeii, previous to his departure for Herculaneum, charging around the stage and piling the agony mountains high. But I could not do it with such a house as that. Those empty benches tied my fancy down to dull reality. I said, these people that ought to be here have been dead and still and moldering to dust for ages and ages and will never care for the trifles and follies of life any more forever. Owing to circumstances, etc., etc., there will not be any performance tonight. Close down the curtain, put out the lights. And so I turned away and went through shop after shop and store after store, far down the long street of the merchants, and called for the wares of Rome and the East. But the tradesmen were gone, the marts were silent, and nothing was left but the broken jars, all set in cement of cinders and ashes. The wine and the oil that once had filled them were gone with their owners. In a bake shop was a mill for grinding the grain and the furnaces for baking the bread. And they say that here, in the same furnaces, the exhumers of Pompeii found nice, well-baked loaves, which the baker had not found time to remove from the ovens the last time he left his shop, because circumstances compelled him to leave in such a hurry. In one house, the only building in Pompeii which no woman is now allowed to enter, were the small rooms and short beds of solid masonry, just as they were in the old times, and on the walls were pictures which looked almost as fresh as if they were painted yesterday, but which no pen could have the hardihood to describe, and here and there were Latin inscriptions, obscene scintillations of wit scratched by hands that possibly were uplifted to heaven for succor in the midst of a driving storm of fire before the night was done. In one of the principal streets was a ponderous stone tank and a water spout that supplied it, and where the tired, heated toilers from the Campania used to rest their right hands when they bent over to put their lips to the spout, the thick stone was worn down to a broad groove an inch or two deep. 
Think of the countless thousands of hands that had pressed that spot in the ages that are gone to so reduce a stone that is as hard as iron. They had a great public bulletin board in Pompeii, a place for announcements for gladiatorial combats, elections, and such things, were posted, not on perishable paper, but carved in enduring stone. One lady, who I take it was rich and well brought up, advertised a dwelling or so to rent, with baths and all the modern improvements, and several hundred shops stipulating that the dwelling should not be put to immoral purposes. You can find out who lived in many a house in Pompeii by the carved stone door plates affixed to them. And in the same way, you can tell who they were that occupy these tombs. Everywhere around are things that reveal to you something of the customs and history of this forgotten people. But what would a volcano leave of an American city if it once rained its cinders on it? Hardly a sign or a symbol to tell its story. In one of these long Pompeian halls, the skeleton of a man was found, with ten pieces of gold in one hand and a large key in the other. He had seized his money and started toward the door, but the fiery tempest caught him at the very threshold, and he sank down and died. One more minute of precious time would have saved him. I saw the skeletons of a man, a woman, and two young girls. The woman had her hands spread wide apart, as if in mortal terror, and I imagined I could still trace upon her shapeless face something of the expression of wild despair that distorted it when the heavens rained fire in these streets so many ages ago. The girls and the man lay with their faces upon their arms, as if they tried to shield them from the enveloping cinders. In one apartment, eighteen skeletons were found, all in sitting postures, and blackened places on the walls still mark their shapes and show their attitudes like shadows. One of them, a woman, still wore upon her skeleton throat a necklace with her name engraved upon it. Julie de Diomede. But perhaps the most poetical thing Pompey has yielded to modern research was that grand figure of a Roman soldier, clad in complete armor, who, true to his duty, true to his proud name of a soldier of Rome, and full of the stern courage which had given to that name its glory, stood to his post by the city gate, erect and unflinching, till the hell that raged around him burned out the dauntless spirit it could not conquer. We never read of Pompeii, but we think of that soldier. We cannot write of Pompeii without the natural impulse to grant to him the mention he so well deserves. Let us remember that he was a soldier, not a policeman, and so praise him. Being a soldier, he stayed, because the warrior instinct forbade him to fly. Had he been a policeman, he would have stayed also, because he would have been asleep. There are not half a dozen flights of stairs in Pompeii, and no other evidences that the houses were more than one story high. The people did not live in the clouds, as do the Venetians, the Genoese, and the Neapolitans of today. We came out from under the solemn mysteries of the city of the venerable past, the city which perished with all of its old ways and its quaint old fashions about it, remote centuries ago, when the disciples were preaching the new religion, which is as old as the hills to us now, and went dreaming among the trees that grow over acres and acres of its still buried streets and squares, till a shrill whistle and the cry of, All aboard! Last train for Naples! 
woke me up and reminded me that I belonged in the nineteenth century, and not a dusty mummy caked with ashes and cinders, eighteen hundred years old. The transition was startling, the idea of a railroad train actually running to old dead Pompeii and whistling irreverently and calling for passengers in the most bustling and businesslike way was as strange a thing as one could imagine and as unpoetical and disagreeable as it was strange. Compare the cheerful life and the sunshine of this day with the horrors the younger Pliny saw there. The ninth of November, A.D. 79, when he was so bravely striving to remove his mother out of reach of harm, while she begged him, with all a mother's unselfishness, to leave her to perish and save himself. By this time the murky darkness had so increased that one might have believed himself abroad in a black and moonless night, or in a chamber where all the lights had been extinguished. On every hand was heard the complaints of women, the wailing of children, and the cries of men. One called his father, another his son, and another his wife, and only their voices could they know each other. Many in their despair begged that death would come and end their distress. Some implored the gods to succor them, and some believed that this night was the last the eternal night which should engulf the universe. Even so it seemed to me, and I consoled myself for the coming death with the reflection, Behold, the world is passing away. After browsing among the stately ruins of Rome and Bahi and of Pompeii, and after glancing down the long marble ranks of battered and nameless imperial heads that stretch down the corridors of the Vatican, one thing strikes me with a force that had never before, the unsubstantial, unlasting character of fame. Men lived long lives in the olden times, and struggled feverishly through them, toiling like slaves, in oratory, in generalship, or in literature and then laid them down and died, happy in the possession of an enduring history and a deathless name. Well, twenty little centuries flutter away, and what is left of these things? A crazy inscription on a block of stone, which snuffy antiquarians bother over and tangle up and make nothing out of but a bare name, which they spell wrong. No history, no tradition no poetry, nothing that can give it even a passing interest. What may be left of General Grant's great name in forty centuries hence, this in the encyclopedia for A.D. 5868, possibly. Uriah S. or Z. Grant, popular poet of ancient times in the Aztec provinces of the United States of British America, some authors say flourished about A.D. 742, but the learned Aafufu states that he was a co-temporary of Sharkspire, the English poet, and flourished about A.D. 1328, some three centuries after the Trojan War instead of before it. He wrote, Rock me to sleep, mother. These thoughts sadden me. I will to bed.